Good evening and welcome. I'm Jillian Kumagai and I'm the manager of the Stanford Health Library. Thank you for joining us for our talk tonight, Living Your Best Life, How Palliative Care Can Help Improve Your Quality of Life. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Grant Smith. Dr. Smith is a palliative care physician and clinical assistant professor of medicine. He provides direct patient care while pursuing his academic and educational interests, improving patient-centered care across settings, increasing access to palliative care, and promoting clinician well-being. Throughout the talk, please enter any questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the talk, Dr. Smith will answer as many of those as possible. And Dr. Smith, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jillian. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And to everyone who's logged on, thank you for joining tonight. I'm so glad that you're here. And I'm really excited tonight to talk about living your best life how palliative care can help improve quality of life. As Jillian said, my name is Grant Smith and I'm a palliative care doctor here at Stanford. And in my clinical roles, I see patients both who are admitted to the hospital as well as patients in our outpatient palliative care clinic. Before we go on, I just wanna point out a few resources that are actually here on this title slide. And the first is I've included our department's website. And there you can find a lot more information about palliative care, the clinical services we provide, and even some more events that we have coming up that are open to the public and free that you can learn even more about palliative care. We also have our Twitter handle. So those of you who are on Twitter, you're welcome to follow us there where you can find more information about what we're up to and additional uh, events we have coming up for the public. Again, thank you again to the health libraries for hosting us tonight. It's so great to be here. In terms of what we'll cover this evening, we'll start by talking about, well, what is palliative care? And then we'll talk more about when and how someone can benefit from palliative care. And then we'll spend some time towards the end talking about the difference between palliative care and hospice. Again, as Jillian mentioned, as questions come up, please feel free to put them into the Q&A section and we'll take time at the end to answer those. I'll also have a few places where I'm interested to hear your thoughts and you can use the chat box to enter your thoughts so I can see those as well. So questions in the Q&A and communicating with me about your thoughts about some questions I'm gonna ask you into the chat box. So we'll start with one of those exercises now and I'd love to see in the chat from you when, what comes to mind when you hear the term palliative care? I think this is sometimes a word that we don't always know what it is. There can be a lot of different things that come to mind, but I'd love to hear some of your thoughts in the chat. And while you're working on putting those in, I'll go ahead and show you what Google image search will tell you about palliative care. And if we look at this, apparently, according to Google, the main thing we do in palliative care seems to be having a young person hold the hand of an older person. And I think really unfortunately in these images, it would lead you to believe that palliative care appears to only be for white or Caucasian people. And I really hope that by the end of this presentation, we'll all be able to understand that palliative care, while we are more than happy to hold people's hands, both physically and metaphorically, that we also have more to offer than that. And we certainly want to be serving a broad and diverse group of patients. So let's see what some of you all said here in the chat. And I see that um, someone had said, this is the step before hospice. That's a great idea. And I hope that tonight we'll talk more about how hospice and palliative care can work together and how they're similar and how they're different. Let's continue to jump in. And I'd like to start with my explanation of palliative care by telling you what I think makes palliative care different from other doctors and some of the other medical specialties. And I'll start off by saying that in palliative care, we really try to start with a perspective where we see the person beyond the disease, meaning that we try to really recognize the individuality of every individual we see and even a turn of phrase of thinking about a person living with cancer rather than a cancer patient. And that's not to say that your other doctors don't see their patients as people, but this is really our focus in palliative care. Another way that we are different is that we take a holistic or a whole person approach to someone's care. 
we think of the person and those close to them in the center of our care. So that would be people like family members, caregivers, loved ones, not just the patient. And we acknowledge that when someone's living with a difficult illness, that there can be issues, not just physical, that there can be suffering, not just in the body, but can be in the mind, the spirit, or even just practical aspects of life can sometimes be affected. And so unlike a heart doctor who focuses on the heart or a nephrologist or a kidney doctor who focuses on the kidney, we don't really focus on a specific, a specific disease or illness or organ. We focus on the person and the family and how an illness affects their person and all the aspects of life that could be affected from an illness. To make sure we do this well, we realize that we really have to work with an interdisciplinary team. So we work really closely with social workers, chaplains, nurses, nurse practitioners, really closely and probably more closely than some of the other medical disciplines out there. In fact, if you come to see me on our first visit, you'll probably meet with not just me, but with me and my social worker or me and my chaplain, because we really wanna do a full assessment of all those components of life. A lot of people wonder, well, what, what role does each person play on the team? And our doctors and our nurse practitioners, we can help prescribe medications to help manage bothersome symptoms. Sometimes we help think through difficult medical decisions or help with something called advanced care planning. We also to help coordinate with other doctors on the team. Our social workers can help provide emotional support either through phone calls or messages, video visits. They can help talk to someone's loved ones or their caregivers, ask about how they're doing, what supports they need. Our social workers can sometimes help people apply for getting medical equipment they need at home, like a hospital bed or a bedside commode, and are available to talk through financial concerns and help potentially to connect to community resources. Our chaplains are also amazing uh, in our clinic, and they help provide spiritual support. Often they're helping tackle what we would call existential distress. And what I mean by that, those are kind of the big questions. Like, why is this happening to me? Or what is God's plan in all this? Or how do I make meaning in my illness? And they can often offer prayers and blessings for individuals. So that's a little bit about our team. And so far we've really focused on how palliative care is different from other specialties. And what I'd like to do next is go ahead and provide a commonly accepted definition to dig in just a little bit deeper. I'll start by reading the definition and then we'll actually go through kind of each part of it and break that down a little bit more. So we'll just go ahead and start with the definition that palliative care is specialized healthcare for people living with a serious illness. This type of care is focused on providing relief from the symptoms and the stress of the illness. The goal is to improve quality of life for both the patient and their loved ones. It's provided by a specially trained team like we talked about, and palliative care specialists work together with the patient's other doctors to provide an extra and essential layer of support. Palliative care is based on the needs of the patient and not on a prognosis. It can actually be appropriate at any age and at any stage or at any point in a serious or difficult illness and absolutely can be delivered alongside curative treatment. So I know that was a lot of information. So we'll take this sort of one step at a time to break this definition down a little bit more. One of the first components we talked about was this idea that palliative care is for people living with a serious illness. And I think that can be a difficult term. I think sometimes for me, when I have the common cold, it feels very serious to me. So how we define serious illness might need a little bit more explanation. And I'll start by just going through a few different examples. But I'd start by saying that any illness that has a reasonable possibility of being life limiting and life limiting over the course of several years would be an illness that would be very appropriate to get a palliative care team involved. 
Some of the common diagnoses we see in our clinics include cancer, heart failure, liver, kidney, or lung disease, neurologic diseases like dementia or ALS or Parkinson's disease. Outside of these diagnoses, sometimes we can be helpful for people who maybe don't fall into a perfect diagnosis category, but maybe suffering in other ways or struggling in other ways, like having to go to the hospital multiple times, like three or four times or more in a year or for individuals who are becoming more dependent on others. Maybe they're not able to eat as much as they used to, or they're losing weight or falling, or they need more help getting around their house. Sometimes those becoming more dependent can be quite serious and need some more assistance. We talked about that in some of the services we provide, is to helping manage difficult symptoms and stress. And this is a list of some of those symptoms that we often and very common that we'll be working on in our clinics. Things like pain, difficulty breathing, nausea, constipation, some of the psychological symptoms we often are working with are anxiety, depression, or just stress or coping, even if it's not necessarily a mental health diagnosis exhaustion or fatigue, low appetite or weight loss, nerve pain. And again, we're also there for caregivers. So as we're thinking about these symptoms, you know, how do we actually go about relieving these symptoms? And as I mentioned before, we try to take a holistic or a whole person approach. And we definitely apply that to physical symptoms too. So let's just use pain as an example here. And when I see someone in my clinic, and let's just think of an example, maybe it's someone who's telling me that their pain is getting worse and they have a cancer diagnosis. And for me, I think about the fact that this pain that they're having is not only nerve endings in their body sending signals to their brain, but that pain may also be making them wonder, is my cancer getting worse? Are my treatments not working the way I thought they were? Maybe this pain is a reason that they can't go to their child's soccer game. Or maybe they wonder, is this pain actually punishment from God? So when we think about pain, we think about it in this holistic perspective and recognize that it could be affecting many parts of life. But that's also how we would manage and try to address pain. We think about not just treating those nerve endings using medications, but we think about using psychological interventions or counseling. We think about integrative techniques, massage, acupuncture. We also think about addressing those spiritual concerns. So the way we think about those symptoms is more than just sort of the physical. We think about it from all these different components and we design our treatment plan to help match all those different components as well. In addition to helping manage some of these symptoms we've talked about, we can also help with making difficult medical decisions. This might include things like doing advanced healthcare planning, and that's kind of an umbrella term that describes thinking ahead in the event you were to get more sick than you are right now, or what you would want if you weren't able to speak for yourself. Sometimes that involves completing advanced directives, or completing something called a post form. And more often than not, we often are helping our patients weigh different treatment options. So to give you an example, in the past few weeks, I've worked with many, several patients where they might be thinking, gosh, my, my illness is getting worse. It's not clear that my cancer treatments are working as well as I wish they were. Time may be limited. And they may be wrestling with the question of, should I get more chemotherapy? Should I stop chemotherapy and focus on my quality of life? And what are the trade-offs between these two different pathways? And that's something that we really want to talk to our patients about and think of, help them think about how they might weigh those difficult decisions. In doing that, we often, I'm often on the phone or through email exchange, talking with their other doctors to help get information or help get their questions answered so that we can best make an informed decision. 
You may have picked up in that definition that we talk about palliative care being an extra layer of support. And we really like to add in not just extra, but extra and essential. Because I think for many of the patients and families we support, they sometimes feel that way. But we are extra and we're in addition to the wonderful doctors that you may already be working with. We partner with every other specialty in the hospital and we never replace the role of a primary care doctor, a cancer doctor, or a heart doctor if you're already seeing those types of doctors for an underlying health condition. We really specialize in helping to control those symptoms and trying to match your care to meet your goals. And your other doctors may be very good at doing that as well. And we're here to help when maybe it gets a little bit more complicated or your other doctors think you need a little bit more help or you find that you would like a little bit more help with some of those decisions or some of the symptoms you may be experiencing. So we're an extra layer of support. We don't take over care from your other doctors. I hope that this slide may be one of the main takeaways that you walk away from tonight with. And that's really the idea that palliative care can be available for individuals at any age or at any stage of an illness and can be delivered alongside curative therapy. There's no age or diagnosis or prognosis or treatment plan that makes you either eligible or ineligible for palliative care. It really is tailored to the individual. I put some examples of the patients that I see on a normal day in clinic, and it can really range from someone who just got diagnosed with their illness. Maybe it's someone who actually is cured from their underlying illness, but maybe they still have some ongoing symptoms either from their prior illness or their treatments. I absolutely work with individuals who are going to be cured from their treatment and they just need to help along a bump in the road on their treatment course. We see people who are getting treatments that maybe we can't cure the underlying illness, but their treatments are helping to slow down or reduce the progression of their illness. And we also work with people who are living with the illness that can no longer get treatments that target the underlying problem, such as getting chemotherapy. So you've heard a lot now about uh, some of the, the, the types of things we do, and you may be wondering, well, does it really work? Or like, what are the benefits? And among my palliative care colleagues, we often joke that if we were a pill, we would be the next blockbuster drug. We would be worth millions. And part of that statement comes from some of the results of a major study that was published in a journal called the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the most preeminent journals for clinical medicine. And they did a study where they looked at patients who had cancer that had lung cancer that had spread to other parts of their body. And they compared people who got kind of the usual care, standard care, versus early palliative care. So from the time of diagnosis, they met with a palliative care doctor once a week. And what they found was that those who got that extra palliative care support ended up living an average of 2.7 months longer than those who didn't receive palliative care. And in cancer studies and cancer treatments, that's a pretty big improvement. I also want you to know though, in addition to um, some of these benefits in survival, palliative care has also been shown to have a lot of other benefits. Things like improving quality of life, better symptom control, people find better spiritual well-being, improvement in psychological symptoms, and greater satisfaction with their overall care. In addition, those people who are connected to palliative care often are able to stay out of the hospital better than those who don't. If they do go to the hospital, they're able to be in the hospital for fewer days. And caregivers often find that they have less burden when there's a palliative care team helping support them. So a lot of benefits that are out there for palliative care services. Well, I've been talking quite a bit so I think it may be helpful for you to hear from some patients who have actually received palliative care services to see what they have to say. So I'll play this short clip and it highlights a few different people who have worked with the palliative care team. And I will say this is not from Stanford. This is from a group called Hackensack UMC. So don't be surprised when you see their logo. Um, but I think what the patients say here reflects some of how our patients at Stanford feel as well. So I'll play this clip for you. 
My name is Melissa Garcia. I'm 42 years old. Um, I'm a single mother of three children, and I have stage four colon cancer. Before I got diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, my life was very busy. I would uh, get up in the morning, go to work, spend time with friends and family. When I was diagnosed with cancer, I, um, I felt my life fall from underneath my feet. We learned palliative care at the hospital. Uh, first, when he was in the emergency room, the, the pain was so, so, so bad that uh, was the, the medicine that they put in, in, in the vein, uh, it, it wasn't enough for him. So palliative care was there. They take the time to sit down with you and get you comfortable. Just the counseling and reaching out to me and checking up on me, it, it just, it made me feel like someone was concerned with what I was going through. I feel that they really were the ones that really helped to get my nausea under control. Again, my oncology team was also helping with that, but the palliative care team working together with my medical team really had other things to offer. I would say to them, thank you for getting me through it. You know, I, I, I know that they're the reason why I'm still here, you know, and the reason why I push on and they're the reason why, you know, my children still have a mom. Well, I hope that was helpful just to hear the voice and the words of some, some individuals who have gone on to get palliative care. You know, a really common question we get asked is, well, when exactly should I ask for palliative care? And what I'd say is that, as we've talked about, if you're living with a serious illness, if you're having or struggling with difficult symptoms, difficult decisions, or just difficulty coping, those would all be really great reasons to come see us and to ask your other doctors for a referral. I'd also say that if you're dealing with symptoms that are starting to encroach on multiple domains of your life, so maybe it's pain that's starting to maybe make you feel depressed, or you feel that you're really rest, wrestling with those existential questions, another great time where we can step in and hopefully be helpful. Another question we often get is, well, who pays for palliative care? And palliative care is fortunately covered by insurance like many other medical specialty clinics. So for example, if your cardiologist is covered, palliative care would be covered. If you have to pay a copay to see your cardiologist, you might have a copay when you see palliative care, but we're covered just like any other specialty. In California, we're lucky that there's been a law passed called SB 1004 which helped provide a provision that individuals who are getting their insurance through a public system have a way to access palliative care for some specific diagnoses. So we're lucky that palliative care in California is quite robust. In terms of accessing palliative care, the first step we recommend is to ask for a referral from a, either a primary care provider or from a primary specialist. That might be someone like cancer doctor, a heart doctor, or another doctor that's seeing you for a medical problem. If you're in the hospital, we see patients in the hospital as well. We have an inpatient team. And you can also ask an inpatient team either for a consultation with our team while in the hospital or for a referral to our outpatient clinic if you're there. I will say that many of our physician colleagues and other healthcare colleagues we're also still learning about palliative care. We're a relatively new specialty. And sometimes well-intentioned physicians or other healthcare providers may still confuse palliative care with just being for end-of-life care. So I just wanna encourage you that if you feel like you would benefit from seeing us, please feel empowered to insist that you really do wanna to speak to a palliative care team. And that could be for help coping, for decision-making support, and it's okay to push a little bit back if you're feeling resistance. With that, I wanna to transition to talk a little bit about hospice because, I, because palliative care and hospice are related, but I think it's really important that you're able to distinguish these two fields. So as I mentioned, first and foremost, palliative care and hospice are not synonyms. Although, again, many people may confuse these, including some healthcare providers. So I'm glad that you all are here to get educated on this and to be 
experts out there in the community. As we've described already, palliative care is a large, broad field that can help focus on that symptom management, quality of life, decision-making components of care. It can be here at any age and any stage of an illness and can be involved even when someone's pursuing curative treatment and will be cured of their illness. Hospice is a type of care that is focused more on the end of life, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. I think sometimes hospice can be a bit of a confusing word and an idea because it really refers to a few different things. It refers to a philosophy of care. It's also an insurance benefit, and it describes a set of services. When I think about hospice as a philosophy of care, it's, it's a very good fit for patients and families when the number one priority is to focus on comfort and quality of life. And hospice approaches care by thinking about every intervention, every lab test, every medicine, every procedure, and asking, will this help someone be more comfortable for today? And if it would help, that's what hospice is going to do. And if it wouldn't help, they would recommend not doing that test, medication, or intervention. The other nice thing about hospice is that they really aim to serve patients and deliver their care where patients want to be and where is most comfortable for them. Some people might think that hospice is a place you go to, but for an overwhelming majority of hospice care, it's provided in individuals' homes. Hospice can be provided in a skilled nursing facility or an assisted living facility. And in very rare cases, there are some hospice houses, which is a hospice facility where someone would go to receive hospice care. But for the most part, hospice is delivered in individuals' homes. As an insurance benefit, hospice is covered by nearly all insurance plans and covered by Medicare and Medicaid plans. And it's the insurance benefit and the insurance guidelines that mandates that patients who enroll in hospice have an estimated prognosis or time left to live of six months or less. Because hospice is typically focusing on comfort, the insurance benefit of hospice typically does not cover things like, for example, cancer-directed therapy, like chemotherapy or immunotherapy. But what I would say is that every case can be individual. So it's always good to ask your doctor or to talk with a hospice agency if you're working with a hospice agency or thinking about working with a hospice agency to ask them what's possible and what treatments you might be interested in and whether or not they could help facilitate those. As a set of services, hospice provides many uh, incredible services that are somewhat similar to palliative care and that they provide an interdisciplinary team that can, is comprised of a doctor, a nurse, case manager, a social worker, chaplains, they have volunteers, and home health aides. As we mentioned, it's primarily home-based care if that's the right fit for families. They have a 24-hour nurse call line that can help to give advice in the middle of the night. And they have the ability to send a nurse on demand to the home. They can help someone transfer to a nursing home or another uh, facility if that's needed. And they help to prescribe and provide medications as well as to provide all medical equipment like hospital beds, bedside commodes, or wheelchairs. It's important to know that hospice doesn't provide 24 hour care. And so much of caregiving is either provided by family, friends, loved ones, or through private caregivers. So with that, we've talked quite a bit about palliative care and hospice and hopefully starting to understand how they're similar and where they're different. I did just want to talk about some of the resources within the Bay Area for obtaining palliative care. And palliative care at Stanford, we have our clinics here in Palo Alto, in San Jose, Emeryville, and launching very soon in Pleasanton. Our program, as well as many of our sister programs at other institutions, provide both in-person and video visits. And the best way to get connected to us is by asking your healthcare provider for a referral. We do accept patient self-referrals, and we can get more information to you about that if needed. And you can also call our clinic to ask 
for more information about how to get a referral. For outside of Stanford, we're very lucky in the Bay Area. This is a list of a few of the palliative care programs. And in fact, these are really the palliative care programs where I have friends where I could call them on my cell phone. So there's probably more uh, places to get palliative care in the Bay Area than listed here. But what I would say, if you're joining us from outside of the Bay Area, getpalliativecare.org is a phenomenal resource that has really cataloged palliative care programs across the entire country. So if you're not sure where to get palliative care, you're outside the Stanford system or outside the Bay Area, check out getpalliativecare.org for more information. And with that, those are really the prepared remarks that I made and I would love to take some of your questions. I know that this can sometimes be a confusing area uh, to talk about, we know that sometimes there's a lot of misinformation about palliative care and hospice out there. So really would welcome your questions. Before we jump to that, I would just love to get your feedback about what was helpful about tonight's event. It's always helpful for us to know how we can improve the content. So feel free to use this QR code. You can scan this by holding your camera on your phone up to this and it will direct you to the survey. And Julian is just gonna pop the survey link into the chat as well. And before we go on to questions um, that Julian will help us moderate, I just wanna encourage you to think about one item of homework and would encourage you to tell one person you know about what you learned tonight. Our goal within our department is really to spread the word about palliative care, to help allay individuals' fears or misconceptions about what palliative care is, so I hope this was helpful for you and would love to take a moment to answer what questions may have come up after tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for a great talk. Um, I have learned so much from what you've said and we do have some great questions and I would encourage people to please use the, uh, the Q&A box in the bottom right of your screen to, um, to add your questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, give you the first question. So you did, you mentioned that uh, people can still receive active treatment for their disease and receive palliative care. And it would be great if you could just talk a little bit more about how that care might work and how that's coordinated. Yeah, great question. You know, several of the patients I see, they're getting active treatment with their oncology providers or their cancer doctor. So their cancer doctor might refer them to our clinic to say, you know, Dr. Smith, could you help to manage this person's pain or their nausea. So they would come to see me in my clinic and we might focus on those areas of care that there are other doctors hoping we can help out with. But we'll also kind of do a full assessment too, like we mentioned of assessing the whole person. So are there any other issues from a psychological, spiritual, or practical aspect we could be helpful with? At Stanford, we run what's called a co-management model. So if you come to talk with me about your pain or nausea, our team will sort of take over the care of those symptoms, meaning that we would prescribe the medications for you, we would provide the refills. If a week after you tried the plan we came up with it wasn't working, we would want you to call us immediately and we would work with you to figure out what do we need to do next to help manage your pain or your nausea. How we work with the other team members is that we would be talking with them about our plans of what we're doing. So after my visits, I'm often sending a message to the oncology doctor to say, I met with Mrs. Jones today. She's having pain in her left hip. I'd like to, I'm going to be starting this medication. Let me know if you have any questions. The other way it sometimes works too is that we sometimes are reaching out to our colleagues to make the referrals on behalf of our patients. So a patient may come to me and ask, gosh, Dr. Smith, um, I really haven't heard from my doctor about where things are with my cancer. And I've tried to ask, is there any way you could help on a physician to physician level to sort of get some more information from me? So that's another way that we sometimes collaborate and work with our oncology providers. And that's true regardless of where they are in their treatment. So I hope that was helpful and feel free to ask a follow-up if I can provide more clarification. Great, thank you so much. Um, can you tell us how long does palliative care last? Great question. And I think one of the things um, that is really nice about our service is that we can help titrate our 
intervention or involvement with individuals care based on the patient's needs. So we are very happy if our patients are able to graduate from our services and that certainly happens with regularity, meaning that they're going through their treatment, they hit a bump in the road, we see them for a while to get them over that bump in the road and then they may not come back to see us and say, I'm good to go. I think we've got what we needed to taken care of. We are also happy to follow our patients as long as need be. So if those symptoms or the issues that we're working on, whether that's nausea, pain, or difficult symptoms, stress or coping, we can continue to follow as long as we feel that it is, it is helping. So it's really great that we can sort of titrate that amount and even the frequency we meet. Some of my patients, I don't need to see for every three, four or six months. Some of my patients I need to see every week because we're really intensively working on some things. So it's nice that you can and sort of titrate that together. And that often is a shared decision that I'm making with my patients. Great, thank you so much for explaining that. Um, we have another question. How does a family member know when it's time for palliative care? It's a great question. And I hope that some of the information we provided about how to define a serious illness, if that applies to you, if you've heard about some of the symptoms we've mentioned or difficult medical decisions, if that applies to you, that can be a great um, time to bring up palliative care. I often think about those referrals as being a joint and shared decision between a patient and the providers they're already seeing. It may be that your provider thinks of sort of palliative care before you would and might think, gosh, I wonder if you would benefit from palliative care. I'd like to have you see them for help with your pain, for example. It is also fine for that to work if you feel that you would benefit from palliative care to raise that question with your other doctors to say, gosh, I went to this talk through the health library. I heard that they could help with these symptoms. Do you think it could be a good fit for me? And so I think often in that context of a relationship you already have with a provider to get a referral can be um, a very typical way that figuring out the time to come to palliative care works. But what I would also say is that at Stanford, we do have a self-referral process. So if you sort of disagree with your provider and think you would really like to be seen and maybe they don't agree, you, we, we will work with you to, to do a self-referral and get you in. And like I mentioned with the other question asked, we would sort of titrate or figure out how often do you need to be seen? And what types of things could we help out with? Great question though. Thank you so much. Um, another question is, um, does palliative care mean that I will die sooner? Great question. I think one of the major reasons that we really enjoy talking with people about palliative care is that I do think there still is in the United States, this idea that palliative care is only for end of life care. And so I think that association does still exist in a lot of people's minds. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, there are actually studies that show that getting involved with palliative care, especially early, can actually lead to improvement in people's survival. And we're still kind of working on the science of why exactly that's the case. There are a lot of theories there, but being involved with palliative care does not mean that your prognosis would be shorter or that you would die sooner. We really hope that we help to make your quality of life as good as it can be for absolutely as long as it can be. So in the majority of our cases, we are pursuing a parallel of great quality of life and as long of a life as possible. And that is what we, we all absolutely want. And we're happy to also work through those challenges when those two parallel worlds sometimes have to come at some trade-offs. So we really hope that we can achieve both of those things all the time. And we're ready, willing, and able to walk with people when there may be some trade-offs around quality of life and longevity of life. Thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, would this topic also apply to sickle cell patients? This is a great question. And um, I would say that this answer is a little bit institution specific, but I would say, and I can go into the details about that a little bit more, but if there's ever a question, I do think that we can be helpful in 
finding the right path and the right treatment plan for patients with sickle cell. Some centers in the US are specialized sickle cell centers where the management of sickle cell related pain would live and sort of be um, overseen by the hematology or the sickle cell experts. And sometimes there's a combination of palliative care or other pain management specialists who would help to provide pain control and address other issues related to sickle cell disease. But what I would say is to not be too worried about asking for palliative care if you are a patient living with sickle cell, because we certainly could help navigate that and figure out within a system, Stanford or outside of Stanford, where's the best place to sort of really own that, that part of your care. So, you know, we could be very helpful for sickle cell disease and a would also want to work with other doctors to make sure that that care plan is as robust as it needs to be working with multiple specialties. Thank you for explaining that. Um, you touched on this in terms of this palliative care question that we just had, um, but somebody has asked, does hospice hasten death? This is a, a, a really good question because I do think that's something that really is the, in the mind of, of people out there. And what I would say is that both palliative care and hospice, when we think about managing symptoms, our goal is to, again, improve quality of life as much as possible and promote as long of a life as possible. When we give a medication, we are always giving that medication and recommending a medication in response to a burdensome symptom. So if we're giving morphine, for example, for pain, we are always giving that morphine in response because we believe there is a pain going on, either from a verbal report from someone or nonverbal signs of pain. Neither in hospice or palliative care do we give a medication with the intent to hasten death unless it is through the very specific and formalized process in California of the California End of Life Option Act, which is probably a great topic for another hour long discussion at the health library. But I would say that uh, I would not want people to think that hospice's goal is to hasten death or that the way they think about using medications is in a way to hasten death is to really respond to symptoms and to help to alleviate those symptoms. And it's never with the intention to hasten someone's death. Thank you. Um, if there are other questions, please enter them into the uh, Q&A box. I will just say, Jillian, this is a great crowd. These questions are amazing and I really appreciate them coming in. So thank you for everyone who's, who's here, who's asking amazing questions. I hope that uh, in the coming days, you'll be able to talk to your friends and family members about what we've talked about here because you're really hitting on a lot of the reasons that we like to go out and talk to people about palliative care and address some of those misunderstandings and misconceptions that are out there. Great. Um, well, it looks like that is the end of the questions. Do you have any other things that you would like us to take away from the night? I'll just say thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. Uh, we really appreciate your time. I know it's in the evening and a long COVID pandemic and appreciate the conversion over to the virtual world. We'd love to get your feedback. So if there are things that you wanted to learn about tonight that you didn't hear about, please let us know through the survey that Jillian put in the, in the chat. Well, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for sharing all of this great info and clearing up myths and uh, helping us become experts. And I will definitely do my homework and uh, <laughs> share some of what I learned. I will do that starting tonight. And thank you uh, for the, to the audience for joining us. And we hope we will see you at our next talk. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Good night.